Hello, everybody. My name is Josh Barrow. I'm the business columnist at New York Magazine. I'm also the host of KCRW's Left, Right, and Center. And I'm very excited to be here today for this conversation with St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank President and CEO James Bullard. Uh, I think all of you know uh, who President Bullard is, but he's a participant on the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, which meets regularly to set the direction of U.S. monetary policy. He also oversees the Federal Reserve's eighth district, including activities at the St. Louis headquarters, plus branches in Little Rock, Louisville, and Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, he is also co-editor of the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control and a member of the Central Bank Research Association Senior Council. He's from Forest Lake, Minnesota, and he received his doctorate in economics from Indiana University at Bloomington. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks, Josh, and thanks to the Milken Institute for uh, hosting this event. Yes. Uh, so this is a strange time to be making monetary policy for a number of reasons, but I think one of the reasons is that the economic policy questions are largely secondary to epidemiology questions. To so decide what policies you need to adopt, you need to develop a view on the nature of the virus, its effects, its likely track of spread. And the Fed, for obvious reasons, is not led by epidemiologists. And frankly, the epidemiologists and the public health experts over the last few months have had a pretty mixed track record in terms of being able to tell us accurately what was going to happen and what we needed to do. So how do you approach policy in that environment? How do you get enough of a grip on a highly uncertain topic where you are not an expert so that you have the right inputs to do policy analysis for the things where you are an expert? Uh, well, we definitely get consulting services from uh, epidemiologists and let me just put in a little bit of a plug for them uh, that's a very tough job you know you have a new disease coming on the scene you, initially you don't know what it is uh, you don't know where it is you don't know anything about it and you're expected to um, act quickly get it under control you've got many different uh, moving pieces it's a global event so uh, so there's a lot to it and it, it's it's very tough but I do agree with you that the models themselves I think um, probably don't take human behavior into account the same way economists would do it um, you know people complain about economists too so uh, so I think that's not a not necessarily a problem but uh, it's going to be very hard to get these things uh, uh, to predict accurately uh, because you're not quite sure what the uh, what the private sector response is going to be to um, to the various twists and turns that the, the virus takes. So I think, you know, there has been an outpouring of research uh, just in the last, you know, weeks or months uh, that tries to combine uh, epidemiology more with economics. And so there's all these different models. It's really pretty fascinating. Uh, I'm not sure, it sure has helped me think about it, but I'm not sure any of those models are actually going to predict, you know, really well in this environment. Because, I mean, it seems to me that, there's, there's been such an increase in optimism since the middle of March, and we see this in all sorts of places, most notably in the, in the stock market. Um, and I think that in general, people feel like the, the data over the last few months has been at least somewhat better than they expected. But it's sort of, there's this big open question, right? As you know, we, we see these very concerning numbers coming out of Arizona. We see some other states uh, where you're seeing what looks like it may be a significant resurgence of cases. And so how do you plan around the possibility that some of the reopening stuff that we've been doing will not be sustainable or, or even needs to be reversed. I mean, you, you talked recently about participants in the economy endogenously adopting better practices, more granular approaches to containing the virus so that we don't need to lean as much on the, you know, the big shutdowns and that sort of thing. And I think we're certainly seeing some amount of that, but I, it, it's unknown at this point, right? How, how effective that strategy is going to be and whether we're going to be able to get as close to normal by the end of the year as a lot of investors seem to think that we will. Yeah, I mean, this is a great area and I'd, you know, I'd like to get your take on it too. I mean, I think just at a basic level, the, the pandemic didn't turn out to be as bad as might have been initially feared. You get this in initial wave and you're really not sure what would happen. And there's, a, you know, there's all this tail risk out there that it's, it's gonna be really, really bad. It was only kind of, you know, relative to that, it wasn't as bad. And so that's probably some of what you're seeing in the market is just that it, it um, uh, uh, the extent of infection, the extent of contagiousness, the extent of fatalities, uh, as bad as it's been, it hasn't been as bad as might have been feared in the, in the March time frame. So that's one thing, uh, and, and markets will react to that kind of thing. And then on this endogenous response, I think initially, 
you know, you don't know what the disease is, you don't know where you're at, you, but every day you learn a little bit about, okay, this is how the virus behaves, this is how uh, it seems to spread, these are the kinds of things that we can do to mitigate the spread. There are other things you can do, but they won't matter very much because that doesn't, doesn't really help to mitigate the spread. And I think that learning goes on over the, really every day over the last 90 days. And that's what I mean by a more granular uh, approach. I think all these entities in the economy, firms, nonprofits, households, they all have tremendous incentives to figure this out and get it right for their situation and adapt. Uh, if, they're, if they're a firm, they wanna figure out how to provide their good or service in a way that doesn't get anybody sick and keeps their workers safe. Um, you know, if they're a household, they wanna figure out, am I at high risk from uh, dying from this disease? If I am, I'm gonna stay out of the way and, and uh, you know, kind of self-quarantine or at least be very careful. So I think all of that adjustment is going on and you'd expect it to be chaos and it is chaos. And you hear all kinds of reports all over the place because that's the way it is when you're trying to learn. But, but that learning I think is occurring and is how we'll, we'll deal with this going forward. I think it's a, it's a matter of risk management really for everybody in the economy. And the other thing about this is it's not really a matter of you know, a politician somewhere saying something you know, this is a matter of individuals getting the information, individual firms, individual entities, and reacting themselves to the situation and try to mitigate their own risk as best as they can. But the, the extent to which that will be an effective strategy, I, th I think, is unknown at this point, right? I mean, there, there are whole yeah. industries in the economy. I don't think we know yet whether it will be, whether there will be any reasonable way for movie theaters to operate between now and some point in the future where there is an effective th therapeutic or vaccine, if that comes. And I don't think we know what the outlook is for indoor dining, airlines. We could go down the list. It's a lot of the economy. And so I guess the question is, given that it's unknown how much that you can rely on that sort of endogenous response and you can rely on individual actors to find ways to modify their businesses to, to work as close to normally as possible, that affects the magnitude of the economic policy response that is needed, right? It, to the extent that there's a lot of the economy that really can't go back to normal within the next year, that means that the, if, if, that's, if that ends up being worse than, than expected, there's going to be, need to be some sort of more aggressive fiscal and monetary response to offset that, right? Yeah, uh, so let, let me just talk about this for a minute. I think uh, one of the impressive things, despite this being the worst quarter of all time from an economic growth perspective, uh, one of the best things that's happened, ironically, is that actual output looks like it'll be 90% of what we would have produced in a kind of a normal quarter. And it seems pretty amazing to me that supposedly the economy is completely shut down and yet you're still able to produce, you know, 90% of whatever you produce. So to me, that, that suggests a couple of things. I think the work from home is very powerful. Um, you know, it's a blessing that we have mobile technology and are able to use it. So that has helped uh, tremendously, I think. Then you had um, essential businesses that, uh, are able to adapt and seem to have done okay. Uh, they certainly have cases and, and certainly have fatalities, but they, they can mitigate the risk for their workers and their shoppers uh, and grocery stores are, are the big example here, but there, there are many others. So uh, other kinds of retail, I think, can copy uh, those examples. And that's gonna leave you with this residual, some of the businesses that you named about whether they'll really be able to bounce back or whether they're just permanently changed or they just have to offer their product in some other way. And I think, you know, something like movie theaters, you know, you might have wondered uh, going into this what the future of uh, movie theaters was uh, given uh, home theater and so on. And this is all pushed, you know, tremendously in that direction. So there will be, uh, I'm not beating up on those guys because they, they may find yet find a way to do this uh, well, but, um, uh, you know, there, there may be some businesses that have to change so drastically that it's just not worth it and they decide to close their doors. But uh, I'm not seeing that for the bulk of the economy. I think the bulk of the economy will be able to get back to uh, the production levels that they were at and it won't be the same. Uh, it's a different world and you have this new mortality risk in the economy that you didn't have before and we all wish it would go away, but it's, it's not going to go away in the near term. 
And so we're going to have to adapt and, and learn to cope with it as best we can and mitigate the risk uh, to the most vulnerable individuals as best we can. One of the key features of the response that we've seen both from the Federal Reserve and from Congress and in the form of many of the CARES Act programs has been an effort basically to, to, to freeze businesses in, in place to the extent that, you know, if a business that was viable in February, if we expect it to be viable in October, we want to make sure that it stays in business, that it retains access to credit. We probably want the employees of that business to not go look for new jobs. We'd rather that they collect unemployment with the expectation that they will go back to the thing that they were doing before within a few months. But as you note, some things are going to come back and some things aren't. And some things, if they do come back, it's going to be quite a long time before they do. And so you sort of have this, this two imperatives at the same time, right? Things that, that we think will come back reasonably soon, you want to make sure stay in place. But things that aren't going to come back, you actually don't want those to stay in place. You want those people to start figuring out now what they're going to do next. And so, I mean, for example, the airlines are under this mandate under the CARES Act to, to, to generally retain employees through September 30th, but they're very clear. They're not going to need as many airplanes next year as they needed this year. There are going to be layoffs. And there probably ought to be in the sense that, you know, we're not going to need an airline sector of the same size for a few years. So how does the Fed manage those two things at the same time, helping the people who need to stay put, stay put, while also fostering the dynamism in the economy to ensure that people who can't and shouldn't stay put, that they find new businesses to start, new jobs to work in, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think part of the uh, idea around, uh, at least initially in the crisis, was that we have to get to a vaccine or a therapeutic at the other side, and if we can, then you probably would be able to go, you know, more or less completely back uh, to normal. I've kind of argued against that mentality. I'm all for uh, trying to get the vaccine or the therapeutic, but you know as well as I do, these are tough scientific problems, and it's uh, vaccine in particular. You know, it's not a good track record for uh, for developing vaccines on this type, kind of time scale. And so I think that it, you'd be better off, uh, at least for planning purposes, to say, uh, uh, let's plan that uh, we're going to have to deal with this uh, disease uh, circulating uh, in the economy for the foreseeable future. So what does that mean for how you would run your business? If you look at something like airlines, uh, you know, I, I could see it becoming uh, more of a luxury market where uh, you spread out the passengers on the plane and you provide more protections and you charge more and you probably fly less flights, uh, but this is, uh, and then that freezes a bunch of uh, lower, uh, lower fare customers out because you can't pack in uh, the customers the way that you used to. Uh, I could see adaptations made like that. So that would actually change the size of the industry uh, but that would be an example of the kind of dynamic that's going on. I think you're referring to about, um, uh, you know, how can you change the way you provide services? And it might provide a different level of service than you would have otherwise provided. Restaurants might be indoor uh, dining might be the same kind of thing. When I've been out in, in New York, I'm, I'm always reminded about how close the tables are together and, you know, how close people are together when they're in the restaurant. But now in the new world, uh, you don't do that anymore, but you have to charge more per meal, and so it's more of a luxury item maybe than it once would have been. Uh, so that changes the industry dramatically, uh, but not completely. Uh, it, it's an alteration in the, in the product. It's not an elimination of the product. That's a pretty grim idea, though, for the longer-term economic outlook, right? I mean, because a lot of these products and services have complements. If it, if it is going to be persistently unfeasible to provide air travel services in roughly the manner that we were providing them last year uh, at, at costs that are, you know, widely affordable to uh, to Americans and, you know, half of Americans on average fly a commercial flight every year. If, that, if a lot of that goes away, that doesn't just affect airlines and people who work in airlines. That presumably reduces the demand for a number of other things, including for hotel and resort stays. Um, also, presumably, businesses engage in business travel for some reason, and if it becomes a lot more expensive and challenging to do that, that activity gets lost, and, and assuming the travel was useful to begin with, that should make the businesses less productive, less dynamic. So that, what you're saying, and, and frankly, my outlook is a little more optimistic than yours on the, on the medical side. So, you know, I think that, I, I think it's going, to, I think that the, this, this situation is going to persist long enough that businesses can't just wait it out. They're going to have to make changes. I, my, my guess is that four years from now, life is going to look extremely similar to how life looked last year. Um, but in the event that that doesn't happen, if this really is a, a permanent or at least a very persistent change, what does that mean for, for long-term output 
expectations. Does that mean lower incomes permanently for Americans, lower standards of living? Um, I don't think so. Um, so uh, let me pitch an idea to you, see, see okay. what you think. Okay. Uh, so there, I think COVID, COVID obviously is very serious and, and is looking to be the fourth largest mortality risk in 2020, according to the mortality tables, and may get into the third uh, third highest, uh, depending on how the disease progresses here. And um, the third largest is accident, accidental injury. So that includes car accidents, and but all other types of accidental injuries. So we've looked at the mortality tables and, um, and just kind of pondered this a little bit. So when you think about uh, car accidents in particular, you know, every time you get behind the wheel of a car uh, or even go out as a pedestrian, um, you know, you're at some risk. And people take that risk, they know about it, uh, they do things to mitigate that risk. They drive cars with airbags and seat belts and uh, they don't, you know, uh, but there are some externalities as well. You have um, drunk drivers and people texting while they're driving and so on. So you're at risk all the time, but the economy has adapted to that risk. Everyone's, everyone knows what that is and, uh, and understands that, that that's a risk that you're taking. Now there's a new risk on the scene that's roughly speaking of the same order of magnitude. But, very but roughly, it, let's, it, let's be very rough here. And now you're gonna have a new steady state with this new mortality risk here, and you're gonna have to take mitigating actions around that uh, new mortality risk that you didn't have before. And it's gonna be painful and you're not gonna like it, uh, but that's, a more, that's what you have to do to deal with mortality risk. But the steady state of that situation seems to me to be about the same as the steady state of, without the new mortality risk, once everybody adjusts. So that's why I'm pitching, pitching you to see if you think that's a... Well, but the thing is, idea. that state is only steady depending on what practices people take to mitigate the spread of the virus. I mean, the, you know, the population level mortality risk from COVID is tremendously dependent on what people do to prevent the spread of COVID. And so if, you, if, if people did nothing at all, and I realize that, you know, the situation where there's no public policy, you still get adjustments on the individual level. So you, you can't actually have the scenario where it just runs completely unabated through the population and kills, you know, 3 million people in a year. The individuals yeah. wouldn't allow that to happen, but that's, you know, it's, it's all on a sliding scale. Depending on what behaviors people engage in, what behaviors the government allows people to engage in, it could be a lot, it, it, it doesn't have to look like accidental deaths. It could look, it could look a lot worse. And the, and the question I'm raising is about the possibility that the things you have to do to keep it at that level where it's about like accidental deaths could, could put a significant damper on the economy because the things that we were doing were, were, were valuable and we have to forego them. Yeah, South Korea. Well, I, I, I so because South Korea faces uh, COVID and they do, they evidently they do a better job than we do. Um, do you think their output is lower? I'm well, not sure. yeah. I mean, my my understanding is that people are in general not out in force in bars in Seoul right now. Okay. Well, um, you know, in steady once they adjust to. to well, but that's the, I, is, is yeah. that, if that's what's keeping them in the steady state, then they can't reopen the. I mean, I mean, I, I think it's I, I think it's an unknown question. Is, is the thing? Okay. I wanted to ask you about uh, something that Chairman Powell talked about at his most uh, recent press conference. He said, uh, in, in reference to the protests that have occurred around the country and concerns about policing and race, racial justice and a variety of related matters, he said, We're, we operate in and are part of many of the communities across the country where Americans are grappling with and expressing themselves on issue of racial equality. He went on to add that principles related to that guide us in all we do from monetary policy to our focus on diversity and inclusion in our workplace and so forth. What, is, what does it mean uh, to, uh, to make monetary policy that aims at achieving racial justice? Yeah, I think, you know, ideally we'd like to see a labor market that had, um, you know, as low as un of unemployment as we could get nationwide. But then also if you break that down, by racial and ethnic groups, uh, you would, you know, you would see no differences or no statistical differences between unemployment rates across groups. Uh, that would be the ideal. Uh, that has not been the case at all in the United States over the post-war era. Uh, black and Hispanic unemployment rates have consistently been higher and depressingly higher, I would say, uh, over that whole period. We were making uh, quite a bit of progress, I thought, uh, coming into this crisis uh, where unemployment was coming down and the gap uh, between uh, black and Hispanic and white unemployment uh, uh, was narrowing. 
uh, and uh, ideally we'd be able would have been able to stay out of this uh, crisis or the pandemic wouldn't have occurred and we could have got that uh, we could have we could have made more progress on that sometimes when you read the literature on this uh, uh, people will say that this is one of the number one you know one of the best things that can be done for racial uh, equality and racial justice is try to keep the expansion going for a long time so that that's very much tied to uh, you know, our mandate from Congress, and, and we certainly try to uh, carry that out as best we can. Is, is hitting the symmetrical inflation target a racial justice imperative? Because, I mean, you know, the, the dual mandate, uh, the, the Fed keeps getting close to the 2% inflation target, but, but not hitting it, not exceeding it. It, it, it looks, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of observers would say that it, it looks like the Fed has erred on the side of preventing inflation rather than on the side of promoting full employment over a period of decades. Um, and as, as you know, the, the gap between white employment and uh, white unemployment and black unemployment, uh, it, it's a, an environment of full employment seems to be the best thing that brings down black unemployment and that pushes up wages uh, for, uh, across the income spectrum, but especially at the low end of the scale. So isn't, does the Fed need to look back at, you know, whether, whether it's doing enough to hit its inflation target and whether that's a, a matter that's, you know, causing it to not promote justice across racial and income groups? Yeah, uh, well, I've certainly advocated uh, defending the inflation target from the low side and, and uh, you know, warned repeatedly that our real risk here was uh, more disinflation or even deflation in some circumstances. Uh, I think, I, you know, to defend the committee a little bit, uh, we did, between 1995 and 2012, it was basically 2% inflation on average. So, um, you know, a pretty good track record uh, up to that point. I actually pointed that out in a speech uh, right around that time. And then immediately after that, uh, we quit hitting our target for about <laughs> seven years. So, uh, but um, I, I do think that there was an expectation from 2012 on that as the economy improved, that the inflation rate would come up to the target faster than it did. And that just didn't materialized and I've, I've criticized that a little bit about over reliance on the Phillips curve and the Phillips curve theory isn't sort of well enough uh, uh, it's not uh, this is regarding the enough we it's not reliable yeah. enough for our purposes and and we have to maybe look at some other things so so I'm sympathetic with the idea that you know in retrospect we were probably uh, not easy enough uh, during the post 2012 period what does the Fed need to do? I mean, the projections now are still for the Fed to, to are still for inflation to be on the on the underside of the target. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, rates are, are at zero. Rates have been at or near zero, uh, essentially constantly for the last 12 years. Uh, what can and should the Fed be doing to get inflation up? We did come off zero for a little while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're back. Now we're back. Um, yeah. I, I think... Uh, well, right now in the second quarter of 2020, this is just a very volatile period and, and it's really um, very chaotic uh, in understanding the economy. So I think it's maybe not the best time to try to assess exactly where we are with respect to inflation. And also, you've had markets completely shut down. Uh, some types of markets were completely shut down, so you didn't actually get any price information from some markets. So it's not that clear that how you want to measure inflation during this period. But uh, I've taken some heart that the uh, tips of break-evens uh, from the market have come back some, and I think that we do have credibility that we're, we are going to try to hit the 2% two, 2 inflation target. Uh, we've got a lot of very aggressive monetary policy and fiscal policy uh, in place uh, to respond to this crisis. So I'm hopeful that we can get a, a pretty robust uh, recovery in the second half here and that uh, inflation will actually uh, come up to our 2% target and we'll be able to hit it. I, I do worry about uh, some of our um, friends uh, overseas. I think Japan has had a tough time here for quite a while and, and now Europe. Uh, I do think that the COVID crisis hit Europe harder than the U.S. Um, you could argue with me about that, but if you, if you look at the largest nations in Europe and add them together, uh, including the UK, uh, you will get a population size about the same size as the US and you will get uh, uneven response across those countries. But if you look at the fatalities, uh, they've, been, they've been higher and uh, hospitalizations have been higher as well. So I think, um, you know, maybe because we're more spread out or, or whatever, uh, we, 
uh, escaped uh, uh, Europe's fate, but they have less ability to react on a fiscal level, less ability to react at the ECB uh, than we do. So I think we're in a little bit better shape than Europe on this. I don't know if you've been finding this, but I, but I find that like regular people talk more about the Federal Reserve than was case, the case a few years ago. I mean, my friends who are not super close followers of this sorts of thi sort of thing have more awareness of what the Fed is doing. Um, and, and I'm wondering if that's your experience with people who are not in the monetary policy business and, and how that, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for the Fed. Basically, you know, to the extent that people are paying more attention to the activities of the Federal Reserve and maybe it's coming under more scrutiny, is that useful supervision or is it sort of better to be operating a little bit more in the background because that preserves Fed independence? Uh, there's been a transparency uh, juggernaut since, uh, really since Greenspan uh, in the Fed and, and even Greenspan uh, made moves toward transparency. They don't look big today, but they were big at the time. And um, I think it's all for the good. Um, it's a democracy, you do want input on these important matters and you don't really want, uh, you know, uh, people hiding behind the curtain or something uh, making these decisions. So I think we've tried to do a better job of being uh, transparent to communicate to a wide audience. One of the things that happened during 2007 to 2009 is that the demand really exploded for uh, un trying to understand the Fed and, and we tried to react to that by, um, trying to meet that demand and, and talk more broadly. And I would say one other thing, I think it's actually helpful to have a big committee uh, because a big committee allows, uh, allows lots of discussions like this one. Uh, the chair still definitely speaks for the committee and, the, and other people like me are, are just speaking for ourselves. But still, when, you know, when members start talking, 90% of what they're saying is basically the same thing. And then the differences are basically shaded uh, nuance around that. But that, I think, I hope anyway, that that uh, explains the public policy a little bit better than would have been the case in the 80s, where you just had this small sliver of people uh, in financial markets that understood the Fed and no one, understood, no one else knew what was going on. Is that affected at all by the, the, the increasing breadth of the Fed's portfolio of activities to, to, to support financial markets? I mean, I think uh, a lot of people, including me, have looked at the response to this crisis and said, you know, the Fed developed tools in the 2008-9 crisis and seems to have been able to do so quickly, develop, uh, deploy them quickly, and it has served the Fed really well to develop these capabilities. But it also means more things that you have to explain to the public why you're doing, why you're setting up a facility with Treasury to buy corporate bonds, that sort of thing. I guess, is, is, it, is it a challenge to, to sort of to explain why, why the Fed would be doing so much? Um, yeah, I, I think it's true the committee is making the policy, but you really want a broad uh, public support for any policy, especially things that are kind of considered radical compared to what the Fed would have done uh, historically. And I think use of these 13-3 facilities in particular to try to uh, maintain liquidity in financial markets, that's something that you really want to be out there explaining. I think one of the goals of the current situation is stay out of financial crisis. You don't want a financial crisis on top of the pandemic. That's gonna make things that much worse. Uh, I think we are at risk of, uh, of depression here. That's not my baseline, but uh, you know, you've got you know, skyrocketing unemployment. You've got potential for businesses to uh, uh, close down here and you've got potential for this to really drag on a long time. Um, so ideally, you want to stay out of that situation and, uh, and be able to keep the economy going as you're trying to deal with COVID. And that's what's really difficult about this, is you've got two things going on at once. We are out of time. I would say one more thing about that. Yeah. that if you get into the depression scenario, the health outcomes and the economic outcomes will be worse. So I think that's really why we should all be motivated to think about how we can stay out of that situation. Well, that's, that, that works both ways, right? You're probably driven into the depression scenario in part because the health outcomes were worse, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, hope, I hope not. I hope the virus cuts us some slack here. Okay, well, you just caused us to leave this on a really grim note, so I... Uh... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, but... Uh, not, that's not my base case, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot.